Praise the Lord, everybody. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord on this wonderful Wednesday evening. We're going to be digging into our apostolic review some more today, and I am very excited. But before I dive into that, I want to go over a few announcements. Our first being, Brother Sullivan will be starting his revival with us this Sunday. Everybody say this Sunday. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do in our revival. I am so excited. I know that he's going to pour out on us, that there are prayers that are going to be answered. I'm asking you to please take time between now and Sunday to take a fast day, to spend some time in the prayer room. We want to come expecting great things from the Lord. If there's one thing I've learned in my time serving God, it is that we get what we put in. When we want something out of a revival, when we, want, when we want God to do something powerful and mighty, if we will come with that expectation, if we will put in the prayer and the fasting work, we will get what we put in. So let's take the time. Let's come together on Sunday, prayed up, fasted up with an expectation that God is going to do mighty things. Amen? Project 144 money is due. If you haven't yet, please turn that in as soon as you can. We've already given to Mother's Memorial. We were so close to beating Merced. And then Sister Emery found a way to sneak 10 more dollars in there right in the final hour. But we're grateful. All that money goes to the kingdom. It's for a good cause. The Lord is going to bless it. So Uh, Our She's for Christ offering is coming up here shortly, and we want to get all of that money in as soon as possible. Parents, I am excited to announce that starting tomorrow evening, we have youth prayer. That'll be right here. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to give that a hand. I'm excited. Our young people and I and my wife will be meeting here at 6 p.m. in the prayer room for a time of unified prayer when young people get together and pray things happen. When you get your youth ministry involved in having a relationship with God and praying, things start to move. Revival breaks out. What amazing timing right here with Brother Tyler. We are starting a season of prayer with our students. This will be every Thursday night at 6 p.m. Bring your mask. We will do our best to distance and follow protocols, but we're going to have a throwdown time in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, On that note, if you have not yet, please remember to schedule some time in the prayer room. Pastor is looking for 100 faithful saints to spend a minimum of 30 minutes and a maximum of an hour in our prayer room, uh, creating an atmosphere of prayer. You can feel it. It It is filling this place. The prayers of the saints are being offered. It's saturating the walls. When you go into that prayer room to pray, it's like you already started before you got there. It's a tremendous feeling, and I want to keep that up, and uh, let's make sure we get on the schedule if we are not already. Why don't we stand together? If you have a need, why don't you raise your hand? We want to go ahead and take a moment to offer whatever needs we may have before the Lord. Take note of the hands around you. Why don't we take a moment and ask God to be with those that are here today, those that aren't, and ask Him to move in our service. Father... We are so thankful for everything that you have done, for your grace and mercy that has once again allowed us, Lord, to be in your house and in the presence of you and your people. We ask tonight that you would see every uplifted hand in this place. You know the need that it represents. And we are praying that right now in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus that that need would be met. Lord, whether it is sickness or blessing or a situation that just needs your attention, we pray that in the fullest of your power, that need would be addressed, Lord, that you would answer that, that that body would be healed, that that financial need would be met, that that blessing would be poured out, Lord. In Jesus' precious and powerful name, we pray. We ask, Lord, that you would be with all those that are sick and unable to be with us, that those that are on vacation would be returned home safely and rested, God. We pray for our upcoming service this Sunday, that your spirit would be poured out, that your anointing would fall on this place, God. Let the miraculous take place. Healings, restoration, blessings, Lord. Let it all pour out in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. 
Everybody said amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I apologize for my few minute late entrance. Normally I try and be very prompt at 7.05, but I got so excited working on my lesson for tonight that I took a few extra minutes worth of grace. It's hard to pack this subject into one session, but I am going to try and do so. This mask is more distracting. I feel the spirit of pastor on me right now. It is distracting me more than it's helping me. So I'm going to put it on the ground. I can feel the spirit of pastor going, that's on camera. I'm going to, here, I'm going to move it. <laughs> we can do this. There's no airplanes right now. I can focus. Now, tonight I am going to be covering a topic that so many Christians in really people in general tend to get a little bit cringy about when we start bringing it up. I'm going to talk about money. Oh, I felt it. Oh, my muscles just tightened up from somebody in the room. Specifically, we're going to be talking about tithe and offering. Now, that's a part of our apostolic review. You know this, right? Tithing and offering, it's a part of the apostolic experience. Now, money is one of those taboo subjects that we as Christians have for some reason become very uncomfortable talking about. A lot of us have no problem talking about what we earn or how we earn it or showing off the fruits of said earnings. But when it comes to the church talking about money, we get that tense, quiet, reserved feeling. Now, we know the world runs on money. You need it to buy food. You need it to put gas in your car. But when we start talking about spiritual financial plans, it's like, ah, don't talk about that, Brother Matt. Don't talk about that, Pastor. Keep your hands off the money. We get that look on our face that's kind of like, ooh, no. Don't touch our wallets. That's sacred ground. Well, thankfully, I'm not interested in touching anybody's wallets. I don't know what was crammed in that purse with it or how long it's been in that back pocket. And so I don't really want to touch your wallet. I promise that what we're going to be talking about today is the fraction of our finances that is supposed to be reserved for God and the work of his kingdom. We're going to be addressing the biblical evidence and principles that govern it. If I had to boil this whole lesson tonight down into one short, too long, didn't listen moment or teal deer for the internet kids in the room, it would be pay your tithes and give your offering. And now that we're fully engaged and either patting ourselves on the back for a job well done or frantically downloading the TPC Hollister app with conviction. Let's talk about tithe and offering. Why specifically paying tithes and giving offerings is important. Do you have your handbooks this evening? I copied everything out of mine and I put it on my tablet. So if you don't see me with my book, it's because I went digital, folks. But let's turn together anyway to page 71 of the Pentecostal Doctrine Handbook. Under heading E, you will find God calls us to be good stewards of his blessings. Did you find it? Do you see it out there on the internet? Do you guys have books? Did you go digital like I did? All right. Now, God calls us to be good stewards of his blessings. Now I want to start with the title here. We run into one of these church terms in it that many of us have heard, but some may not actually understand. What is a steward? Is it a person who looks after passengers on a ship? Is it the person who brings me pretzels on a plane because peanuts are a no-no now? I prefer the roasted peanuts, thank you. Just don't accept them if you have an allergy. No. 
neither of those things. The definition of a steward in the context we're looking at here is a person employed to manage someone else's property. Now, right away, I can hear the thoughts that I once had when I was younger. Wait a minute. I'm not managing somebody else's property. That's mine. I'm managing my property. I earned that money. I worked hard for it. And yes, okay, that's true. But, but is it really? Is it really ours? As Christians, we believe that everything we have in our lives comes from God. We believe he holds our very world in his hands. We trust him to govern it according to his will. We're talking about money, brother. Go ahead and bring those plates up here. Let's just, let's be obvious about it, not even worry. <laughs> we believe that God holds everything in our lives in his hands. So is it really a stretch to think that he's the source of our finances as well? If he can bless us, if he can take care of us, if he can save our very souls, is it really so hard to think that the money in our pocket came from him too? Now, Job sure thought so. Good old brother Job. In the face of losing everything in his life, his financial security, his children, his entire livelihood, he had this to say in Job chapter 1 and verse 21. That's not in the book. This is extra. Job chapter 1 and verse 21. It says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Brother Job believed that everything he had came from God. I could refer you to the story of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 through 30, where it likens the kingdom of heaven to a man traveling to a far country. He leaves his goods in the hands of three servants or stewards, if you will, and trusts them to deal with it properly, to grow it, to manage it, to take good care of it. And we see what happens at the end of the story when the poor steward, the foolish servant, doesn't grow his master's money. He's condemned. He's punished. He didn't deal well with what was not his. However you choose to see it, Job had it right. God gives and God takes away. Everything that we have, our family, our money, our health, our wellness, everything in our lives belongs to him. It's our job to take care of it, to tend it, to grow it, to deal wisely with it. And in all that he gives us, he doesn't even demand all of it back. Just a portion. So what is the tithe then? No, I, I didn't say tie. I'm not wearing one of those, as you can see. We've been delivered from the bondage of the necktie here on Wednesday nights. I'm talking about the tithe, T-I-T-H-E. It is 10% of our increase. This is the amount of our income that belongs to God. It's the amount of what we have that he insists we return to him after he gives it to us. Now, there is admittedly a lot of nuance and quite a few weeds that people could get lost in when we start talking about what increase means. Some people give 10% of their gross, and others give 10% of their net. Both are right, and neither is wrong. If you give on your gross and get a tax return, can somebody tell me what a tax return is? I haven't seen one of those in years. If you get a return and you've already tithed on that money, then you don't have to pay tithes on it. Some say you do. Some say you don't. If you tithe on your net and get a tax return, again, what is a tax return? Can somebody show me? I haven't seen one of these. You need to tithe on that return as that's considered 
increase. Some may feel like everything that comes in is increased, though a lot of people consider gifts like birthday money not to be. I'd like to see you tithe on those Olive Garden gift cards. Go ahead and send those breadsticks directly to my home address. I'll give it to you after church. I'm not here, though, to get lost in the minutia. I don't want to dig around into concepts and ideas that are outside the scope of the 10%. This is our starting point. It's here that in fear, trembling, and prayer, and consulting with our pastor, that our 10% is given. It also comes with a stern warning. Don't try and rob God. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ladies and gentlemen, trying to play games with God's money brands one a thief and a liar. And we don't want to end up in that position with the Lord. He is always going to get what's his. Even if he has to get it through other methods, whether he has to take it from your broken down car, your bad spending habits, or any other medium that prevents you from having access to what was supposed to be his in the first place. Trust me, from the voice of wisdom and experience standing before you today, give your tithe. Pay your tithe. I've tried it both ways. And only one of them works. As a very young man, not willing to just accept things that faced value, I played cops and robbers with God, and I lost. Badly. The tithe is the Lord's, and it's not something to be treated lightly. All right, so we know tithe, it's important. There's warnings. There's risks. We need to pay our tithe. But why? Oh, I love the question, why? Anybody with kids ever have them ask the question, why? Go clean your room. Why? Have you seen it? I don't think that needs an explanation. Now that we definitively know what the tithe is, let's talk about why we do it. If I didn't adequately scare you already, which honestly isn't my goal in the first place, let's get into the black and white scriptural reasons for why we tithe. Let's turn together to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. You remember how I mentioned earlier that everything we have is God's? Maybe you asked yourself, well, how is that possible? This is it right here. He gives us the power to get wealth. He gives you the skills that you need to earn it, the health in your body to be able to get up and go to work in the morning. He gives you the mind that is able to hone what he has given you and learn and go to college and go to school and better yourself so that you can make even more money to live on. That is all given by God. It comes from him, and as such, the entirety of that living is his. The good news is he doesn't ask for all of it back. He lets us keep 90% of it, quite unlike our esteemed government bodies, who insist on taking much, much more than 10%. And if you don't believe me, take a look at your pay stub. And when you're done crying, look at me and go, yes, Brother Matt, you're right. And they get it before the check is even written. Tithing requires faith. And God asks us to prove him by trusting him with our money. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the hardest things we do as Christians, trusting God with our money. 
It's easy to look at that tithe check week after week and think about what you could have bought with it instead or what bill you could have paid down. But ladies, gentlemen, it is not our money. It doesn't belong to us. That 10% is not ours to use. One of the things people can falsely get wrapped up in is this idea that the tithe is paid to the pastor. That's not the case. We don't pay the pastor our tithe. We pay our tithe unto the Lord. It's God's money. We're just giving it back. Now, God chooses this method to support those who give themselves full time to the work of his kingdom, and he expects the pastor to be a good steward of that money, too. Just like he expects us to be a good steward of what he gives us, the pastor has to do well with what is entrusted to him. Even the ministry pays tithe. Now that we know what tithing is and why we do it, let's dig into the origins and scriptural foundation behind it all. Tithing makes its very first appearance in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, with Abraham. Anybody here know who Abraham is? Abraham was a man blessed by God and the father of God's chosen people. Now one day, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah get themselves all embroiled in a battle with a bunch of other neighboring monarchs, and they lose. They bite off more than they can chew, and their enemies take all of their goods. They raid the army, they capture all of the valuables, and they even kidnap Abraham's nephew, Lot. Now Abraham, being a man of considerable means, has an army of his own. And when he finds out that Lot's been captured, he mobilizes that army to get him back. He goes out and defeats the armies that captured his family member and recovers everything that was lost. He even frees Lot to go back to doing whatever it is he's up to. After this great victory, the king of Sodom and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, come out to greet Abraham and thank him for his help. Melchizedek also happens to be the priest of the Most High God, and it's here that we witness Abraham tithing for the first time. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. Genesis 14 and 20. It says, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. This is the first time we see this in action, and this is Abraham tithing of everything that he has recaptured from the enemies of kings that he's not even really associated with. He just went out there to get Lot back but it's an increase and he pays a tithe on it. We see this happen again with his grandson Jacob after he has his vision of a ladder reaching into heaven with angels going up and down and the Lord standing on top of it. This vision is so powerful. It so moves Jacob when he sees it that he vows a vow in Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 through 22. Genesis 28 20 through 22. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth un to thee. Think about this for a minute. Jacob's first response to God rocking his world with a vision isn't to make promises that, okay, God, I'm going to live for you forever. I'm going to be the best that ever was. I'm going to dedicate my future kids to you. You, you know the old uh, kind of idiom or, or idea that if you, if you help me, God, if you get me out of this situation, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll live for you forever. Jacob doesn't do that here. 
in this life-changing moment, he reaches back to a principle taught to him through his father and his father's father. He promises a tithe, 10% of everything God gives him. I love how he doesn't put limits on it. He doesn't go, God, I'm going to give you a tithe of uh, a tenth of a fifteenth of a quarter of my quarterly revenue, which is after I've paid my debts and I've, I've completed a full accounting of all of my you know, bank accounts and income. He just says, God, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything. He doesn't run it through a lawyer first to make sure the contract is ironclad. It's a simple promise. God, you gave it to me, so I'm going to give it back. I can recall many times how the Lord has preserved me because of faithfulness to giving the tithe. Now, there are semantics here where you say paying tithe and giving offering. Now, for me, it's all the same. When I put that tithe in the app and it goes off, and reappears magically in the church's bank accounts, I gave it, I paid it, whatever you want to call it, it wasn't mine, it's the Lord's. It's His. So if you catch me using those two words interchangeably, I'm not making a mistake, I just see them as the same. Perhaps one of the most trying of these moments in my life uh, where I was proved in my faithfulness was a time when the company I was working for started falling apart. My hours at work were cut down to almost nothing. We're talking like five hours a week that I was working. And I was married to Danelle, and we were living in an apartment that was like 950 bucks a month, which seems so small by today's numbers. Um, But we were trying to survive, and we couldn't. And every time I'd get paid for those five hours, my, my paycheck was like 250 bucks. I was looking at it going, ah, but my rent... I paid my tithe first. I remember losing my apartment. I remember my truck being repossessed. I remember sitting at a makeshift desk in my in-law's garage pondering what I had done wrong with my life that I was in this situation now. I remember praying and asking God, why is this happening to me? Why? I've been faithful. I learned my lesson from years ago. Why is this happening now? Here I am selling my iPhone to pay for my wife's car payment that month, living in an uninsulated garage with what looked like a jet engine as a heater. Why am I in this situation? I remember the Lord telling me in that moment as I filled out yet another job application, be still. More terrifying words have I never heard from the Lord. Be still. It's not our natural inclination to be still. And while I'm sitting there living with my in-laws who are amazing people, but with whom I do not want to live long term, being still was not high on my list of priorities. In fact, I was putting as many job applications out there as I possibly could. In the end, as God told me to be still and not push for a job I was hoping to get, it was the right move. For the first time in my life after that, I was put on salary with guaranteed money and hours and was finally making a grown man's wage. God provided, even when things were bleak, because he's faithful. He's faithful. I gave that 10% even when it was 25 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever it was. And because I gave him what was his, he took care of me when I needed him most. He is always proven we cannot outgive him. Now, this principle of paying tithe that starts with Abraham and his family eventually becomes law in Leviticus as the Lord directs Moses for the future of his people. Looking at Leviticus chapter 27 and verse number 30. Leviticus 27 and verse number 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, 
is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Look at that last word used to describe the tithe. It is holy unto the Lord. That's special money. That's dedicated money. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. It's seen again as the inheritance of Israel is divided among the tribes in numbers as a method for providing for the priesthood, kind of like how we give it to God and it provides for our pastor. Let's look at Numbers chapter 18 and verse number 21. Numbers 18 and verse 21. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. We see it a couple verses down in Numbers 18 and 24 as well. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. This money God uses to provide for the priesthood. He uses it to provide for the man of God, but it's not, that doesn't make it the Levites. They didn't get to go and do whatever they wanted. They couldn't squander it. They couldn't throw it out on the ground and stomp on it or light it on fire. You know, they, it was important that they did what was right with it, just like it's important for the ministry today. It's God's money. Now, before we start saying things like, didn't the death of Christ remove the need for the law of Moses? Yes, it did. I want to show you that this transcends dispensations from the law to grace as a continuing method to provide for ministry. The Apostle Paul chastises the Corinthian church about their giving in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 14. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 14. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth, should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ." Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now, in our modern world, there aren't that many full-time preachers, especially in the state of California. If you look at the licensing statistics of the United Pentecostal Church International, the majority of licensed ministers in our movement right now are what is called bivocational. That means they preach at night and work a job during the day. This is seen in Paul's writing to the Corinthians here too, where he says, look, I haven't collected any of this from you. It would be perfectly right for me to do so. It would be totally acceptable and well within the bounds of my ministry to live off of the tithe of this church, but I don't. However, you still need to give your tithe. And our pastor is full-time. This is his job. He ministers to our church. He goes out and prays for us when we're sick. He goes to the hospital when they used to let him before COVID. He takes care of our spiritual needs. This is put in place specifically for full-time ministry to exist. As one of those bivocational ministers, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it is very difficult to be a bivocational preacher. 
I have to work a job just like everybody else. And I'm not asking for pity, okay? This is what God called me to do, and I do it with gladness. I work the same job just like everybody else does, long hours, whatever. We all do it. We got to eat, right? And then at the end of the day, I get to come do this, which is my privilege. I'm enjoying teaching you even with some of the sour faces I'm getting talking about money. It is a joy for me to be able to stand here and do this. And perhaps one day the Lord will see fit for me to be able to be full-time and live from this method as well. But for the time being, I want to tell you this is important. This is necessary. I don't feel bad when I write my tithe check or I put the amount into the app. I am grateful that God has blessed me with the strength and the skill and the ability to be able to earn and give back just 10 percent. Now, Paul uses strong language here, but it tests our sometimes carnal spirits. When we start talking about the instruction, the requirement of a 10% tithe, how does that hit you in the spirit? Does it make you angry? Does it frustrate you and make you say to yourself, all this church cares about is money? Does it offend or inspire? If it offends, then maybe we need to examine our lives, our prayer, check our spiritual health. These aren't things that are ordained by man. Pastor didn't go there in his office one day and have a meeting with himself and say, you know what, I really need 10%. This is God ordained. The Apostle Paul writes about it again to his son in the gospel, Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 18. 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 18. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. How the tithe is used isn't something we should bother ourselves with or be concerned about. We give it to God, and God trusts his man with it. The man of God answers to God for how he does it. That's not our problem. It's not our concern. Our only worry is to be faithful in what God asks us to do. Now, as much as we're commanded to pay the Lord his due in our tithe, it should be noted that there are consequences for failing to do so. As I mentioned briefly in my early remarks, God doesn't take a failure to tithe lightly. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and Offerings. When I read this scripture and I get to the part where it says, where when have we robbed thee? I hear it in a very specific voice. I hear in my head a person standing there at the judgment seat of God, right as they are about to be denied entry into heaven, going, where did I rob you with, God? Wherein have I robbed thee? And God going, in tithes and offerings. I made it plain. This is where. Moving on to verse number 9, it says, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God makes no bones about it. A failure to be faithful in your tithe is as good as a financial death sentence. What I like about it is he doesn't just leave it there with all stick and no carrot. He finishes it off with, if you'll do these things, I'm going to open the windows of heaven. I'm going to pour out blessings on you more than you can contain. I'm going to give you increase and there's not going to be enough room To receive it, God, my bank account has lots of room to receive. Now, I'm a human being just like you, okay? I've started writing that tithe check and thought to myself, man, this money could keep my cell phone from being shut off. 
I'll admit to my humanity and tell you that there were times in the past where I did stop writing the check and foolishly pay the bill instead. I watched every single time that I made that poor decision as the curse described in Malachi ripped through my money situation like a disease. It does, it just tears through there like, I, don't even, I can't even give it a good metaphor right now. It's that bad. I remember looking, you ever do that thing where you get up in the morning and you look at your bank account first thing on your phone, you're like, ah, I'm hopeful I'm broken. I've done that so many times. Now, I've watched as inexplicable bank charges, money seemingly vaporizing into thin air, things breaking down, unexpected bills showing up in the mail, or this is one of my favorites, bills getting charged early. It's like, wait a minute, that was scheduled for the 16th. Why did it come out on the 10th? All the wonderful things that go with not paying my tithe. Let me tell you with all certainty that there is a heavier price to pay when we mess with God's money than any consequence that comes from putting it first. Even the Pharisees, men whose entire self-worth rested in their appearance of vain holiness, were blasted by Jesus in Matthew 23 for their giving. He describes them first in verses 3 through 7 of Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 3 through 7. You guys know when I teach, I'm not going to stay on book, right? I can see the books getting turned upside down. Like, Where's that? I don't see that. Matthew 23, verses 3 through 7. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Great description for the Pharisees. They say, but they don't do. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Jesus does not have any great love for the Pharisees, okay? I don't know if he hung there on the cross and went, I'm doing this for everyone except you. I doubt it. But if it was me, maybe. Um, (laughs) Establishing that they're hypocrites and phonies, he tackles their giving next in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. Matthew 23 and 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. It's got an exclamation point, so I'm going to use it. Hypocrites. For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. They went overboard in their tithing. They went so far, they lost the meaning of it. They turned it into some method of vanity and self-validation instead of a humble and faithful returning to God that which is already His. I bet they would have tithed on their Olive Garden gift card. The long and short of it is this. It is better to be faithful in our tithe than to try and mess around with what isn't even ours to begin with, of all that God has blessed us with, of all that he has done for this church family, even in the midst of COVID, 10% of it is his. It's an amount I will gladly give until the day I die. And my kids better pay 10% on their inheritance. My dad's planning on me paying tithe on 10% of his lanterns. I don't even know how I'm going to do that. Who wants 10% of lanterns? (laughs) It's a serious and weighty matter. And before I go forward, I wonder if we might take a minute and ask God to let this dig down deep into our hearts until it's rooted into the fiber of our being. Lord, 
This is a serious matter that we're talking about tonight. And I know that it can be fun and we can make it serious and we can make it scary. But however we choose to approach the subject, this is a heavy matter. Lord, I am praying that right now that everybody under the sound of my voice would hear that we must be faithful in the tithe. God, this is something you established a long time ago, and it's not something that we can play with. And I am praying that it would get, it would get deep into our heart and soul, that it would reach down into the core of our being, and that we would make up our minds right now, I will be faithful. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Now we've spent some time talking about tithe, but what about offerings. Tithe is mandatory. It's 10%. God demands that we do it back. It's got bad consequences if we don't. But what are offerings? I want to start with the same question we asked of tithes. And as Brother Bernard so aptly puts it in our doctrine handbook, while God will take money from a grouch, he loves a cheerful giver. We pay our tithe because we have to we give our offering because we get to. Now, our offerings are any amount that we give above and beyond the tithe. This is a free will offering for which there is no mandatory amount. If you want to know what kind of things the offerings go to, they go to things like paying the building lease, to keeping the lights and air, which is not presently running, as is evident by the perspiration on my forehead. We pay our tithe, but we give our offering to the work of the kingdom. And for this, there is no mandatory amount. When we give, we're instructed to do so with gladness because God has given us the ability to do so. A good steward of his blessing, as we should be, we have the wonderful opportunity of giving back to him of the abundance that he has poured out upon us. So I can hear at least one voice out there, maybe somewhere on the Internet, but I feel you right now. I know it's here because there was a time when it was in my own head. If the offering amount isn't set, then why give one at all? Can the offering amount be $0.0000001? Because the app won't take that, and they don't make coins that small. So I might as well just not give it, right? The answer is simple. Because our greatest blessings come from our free will offerings, not the commandment of the tithe. Now, there is a tithe payer's blessing, but the tithe is mandatory. If you really want to be blessed, you got to give offerings. That's free will. That's an amount that you get to decide. And God says, you know what? I am going to bless you proportionally to what you're able to give. It's a wonderful opportunity. And what's best about it is God will never let you outgive him. That's a challenge that I have taken on and lost many, many, many times. And there are people in this room that are here today who have been highly blessed that have tried. You cannot outgive God. You just can't do it. He's competitive that way. Oh, I like to win. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. What, what a colorful way of putting it. What a beautiful method of taking language and saying, I'm going to give you a whole bunch. If you give. Anybody here that's lived it? I've lived this. I've seen God press it down and shake it up and squish it together, and then all of a sudden I'm looking around going, God, how did we get here? I'm okay with it. Thank you. 
Now we're expected to be good stewards, so we should approach giving with that in mind. In our church, we have a principle of paying, or we have the necessity of paying 10% tithe and a principle of giving a 5% offering. It's easy math. Half the tithe, done. $40 tithe, $20 offering. I love easy math. Don't be getting all into, okay, I'm going to give 35.6279% of a quarter of the, um, no, easy. 10, 5. I've lived this in my life. It was instituted a long time ago in this church before pastor became our pastor. And it was put in place by the previous pastor so that we could support having a full-time preacher. 10% is God's. 5% we get to give. There are countless stories among the people present in this place today and those watching online that can testify to the blessing of the 10-5 principle. And there are some of us who go even further and do 10-5 and 2. 10% tithe, 5% offering, 2% missions. Because there are people out there going to places that we can never and will never go. I've lived it, and I can tell you that the blessings that I enjoy today come from the mercy of God and the blessing of a 5% offering. Now, like tithing, offerings also have an origin going all the way back to the Old Testament and carrying forward to the modern church. Exodus chapter 25 and verse number 2. Exodus 25 and 2. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. Now, fresh on the heels of escaping Egyptian bondage, the Lord instructs Moses to take an offering of the people of Israel who just spoiled the entire nation of their captors. What I love about this is that Israel gets a serious spirit of giving. In Exodus 36 and 5, it says, And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine for just a second, I would absolutely love for pastor to have to get up on a Sunday and say, y'all stop! You're giving too much! We can't spend it! Stop giving to the church. Oh, I'm telling you, the day that happens, there's going to be a trench burned in these uh, pews and in the the aisles from all the running that's going to happen. It's going to look like the road runner. (laughs) People taking off all over the place because we've given too much. There's no set amount, but man, they gave. The children of Israel gave. Like I mentioned before, unlike the tithe, there's no specific percentage we need to give in offering. Now, I've touched on the idea a couple times of giving 5%, but the Bible doesn't specifically define this amount. It's a principle that many of us have successfully chosen to live by, but it's not required. As far as giving being necessary, the scripture has this to say in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. Give what you're able according to how God has blessed you. Can you give 1%? Do it. Give 1% and enjoy the blessing of the 1%. Can you do five? Can you do more? That's a matter of prayer and ability, but we ought to give. We need to give. The amount isn't as important as the act Jesus demonstrates this to his followers in Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Luke 21, 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. Come on, rich men, cast it on in. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. 
And he said, of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she hath of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. This woman gave everything. Now, what I don't want to give you the impression right here is that God is saying, okay, go empty your bank account now and put it all in the offering. If God's talking to you about doing that, then obey God. But we're not saying that, okay? I'm not getting up here and saying pour out your entire bank account. What I am saying is give as you are able. And there have been times in my life where God has said, I want you to give sacrificially. And let me tell you the best blessings, the best and deepest and most fulfilling outpourings of God come from the sacrificial offering. Time after time, I have given amounts and seen God explode it. Just recently, I think within the last, it would have been the last men's conference. I was up here and we were having this incredible church and there was a spirit of giving. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to sell your phone and take that money and put it in the offering. Now, I had been thinking of selling my phone so I could buy something shiny. But the Lord said, no, I want you to give it. That's it. So I did. Sold it. Sent the money out with the app. Zap, there it was. Gone. Well, it was time for men's conference. I didn't have money for men's conference. I get a phone call. Brother Matt, the Lord is moving on me to give you a blessing. I want to give you $400 for men's conference. Hello. Literally within hours of my having sent in the offering, God said, thank you, here you go. This is yours. I'm going to take care of men's conference for you. You know how much I need for men's conference? Like 150 bucks. It's free, guys. All you got to do is pay for your room. <laughs> I'm going to hold that comment to myself. <laughs> it's funny, though. <laughs> now, how, how we give can be a gauge of how faithful we are. If we're good stewards, we give. If not, then we don't. And if we don't give, we probably don't pay our tithes either. Just kind of a, an indicator for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. When we give, we are being faithful stewards. Not only is it a measure of our faithfulness, but we get out of it what we put in. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 say, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. What does that mean in plain language? If you can give ten, but you give one, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you can give ten and you do, you're going to reap bountifully. Verse number seven, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I want to pause on the last part of verse number seven. Note that it talks about the spirit in which we give. Now, I've been talking about how God will bless you and he will give you wonderful things when you participate in the great blessing of giving. But did you know the spirit that you do it in has an impact? If every time you write your offering check, you go, well, give this money to God. I'm gonna, all right, God, you, you saw this. I'm going to take it out of my, my clenched fist. I'm going to pry it out and let it fall into the offering plate and snatch at it a couple of times before it falls on the ground. And then it gets in there, and I'm going to go, all right, God, you saw that. Now what are you going to give me? What kind of blessing are you really expecting? 
God's going to look at that and go, huh, well, that's a sweaty offering. I don't want that. I bless you with uh, not cancer. God can bless us in all kinds of different ways. The spirit in which we give matters. If we give with an expectation and a demand of return, we pervert our gift. We take what is intended to be done cheerfully and with no regard to where it goes. We're just giving it to God because we can, and we turn it into something gross. God loves a cheerful giver. You may not be able to outgive him, but if your giving has ulterior motives, you may not get what you're expecting. Now, what I love about giving is it is something above and beyond ourselves. We don't give necessarily so that it will stay here. We give in the hope that it will go out that it will go and bless the kingdom. Acts chapter 11 and verse 29 says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Our offerings help people. If you want to ask, if you're asking yourself the question, how can I help others? How can I reach into communities that I don't have access to? How can I make a difference in this world? Give! Give to She's for Christ. Give to Mother's Memorial. Give to Christmas for Christ. Watch as those funds are taken and they leave our church and they go to Tupelo Children's Mansion where kids that nobody wants are given a second chance. As it goes to support programs to help mothers choose adoption instead of abortion. As it goes to put vehicles in the hands of missionaries who are going into countries where we have no hope of reaching to reach the lost and save souls. Give, give, give because you can. Give because it's a good thing to do. Give because it matters. God will bless it and it will go out and make a difference. Amen. I'm passionate about giving. It matters to me. I have a vision and a dream to one day build a Bible school overseas. It's a goal. Does that sound crazy? Well, maybe it does, but I want to do it. I, I love my wife and I. We have these, these sessions where we'll sit there in the car in the living room and go, if we had $10 million, what would we do? We'd pay off the church. We'd buy a church building for every missionary. We'd do this. We'd do that. And in the end, we get down to like, okay, well, you've only got like a million dollars left. Well, well, okay, we'll buy a house. That's the kind of spirit that I want to live with. That's the kind of principle that I want to have. Give with no expectation of return, but grateful for the blessings that follow. Why don't we lift our hands one more time before we close tonight and thank God for speaking to us on this important subject. Father, we're so thankful that we could be able to come into your presence, that we could be in the house of God tonight to talk about important things like tithe and offering, things that matter, God, things that make a difference directly in our lives and in the lives of others. I pray that every word, every scripture, every principle and thought and idea would take root in the minds of every one of us, that as we leave this place, we would be cheerful givers, faithful tithers, men and women that love to participate in the financial plan of your blessing, Lord. We thank you so much for all that you've done and for your hand that has been upon us tonight. I pray that you would bless these faithful saints as they go home and bless them as they go to their work tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for your faithful attention on this important topic. Pastor and Sister Hurst were out enjoying an anniversary trip tonight, so I got the honor of being able to teach you. Pray with me for their safe and rested return, and I will see you all Sunday at 1030 for prayer. God bless you.